Hi, everybody. How are you doing today? So we're going to talk about chapter 20. And this might seem really backwards, right? Because chapter 20 is at the end of the book. But actually, there are a lot of concepts in chapter 20 that you need to know at the beginning of the school year because we're going to build on them and learn about them all year long. Okay. So basically, some of you are in economics right now. Um, that's awesome if you're a senior or maybe you took it this summer, but there is a lot of information about economics and international and national policy, stuff like that in this chapter. Okay. So we're not really going to go super in depth with ec economics, sorry, but you will have to know a few things and have a basic understanding about some well-known principles. So here we go. Let's have at it. All right. So sustainability, we talked about this last chapter. Um, and I've mentioned it a gajillion times, but this class isn't just about the environment, right? It also takes into account the economics and social aspects of all situations, all right? So there's this vocab word that you guys will have to know, and it's called the triple bottom line. So if you look at this Venn diagram over here, as you can see, there's three circles. There is the environmental circle, the social circle, and the economic circle, right? Um, basically, what the triple bottom line says is that we need to take into account these three different things, okay, in order to have sustainability. So right there in the middle where those three overlap would technically be when we've reached uh, sustainability, right? We're taking into account all these different things. So one of the problems that we have is that lots of different businesses and stuff like that might accidentally focus on one of the circles too much and neglect something else. For example, you know, a certain business might focus on this economic pillar and completely ignore the environmental aspects or social aspects of, you know, their situation. Okay, so <laughs> let's go to the next slide. I've got so much energy right now, you guys. Okay, let's look at this. Here is where we get into economics. All right, so you're probably wondering why the heck do we even need to talk about economics and environmental science? You are not in economics class, right? Basically, in an attempt to reduce environmental harm, researchers and policymakers all over the world have experimented with a whole bunch of different techniques to encourage consumers like you and me to change our behavior in ways that would be beneficial to the environment, right? So they're trying to push people to do responsible things that will also help their environment. Things that you're going to learn is the term market economy, okay? So most economies today on this planet are called market economy. Basically, that just means that a market occurs wherever people engage in trade. Okay, so when a good is in great demand and wanted by many people, producers are typically unable to provide an unlimited supply. But we have a thing called price, right? Dollar dollar sign. So price is a way that producers and consumers communicate the value of an item. Okay, so if you look at this graph, I promise I wasn't gonna say okay that much. Okay, let me I'll have to cut that out too. Okay, the law of supply. So if you look at this graph right here, this is showing you the relationship between supply and demand. Okay, so you can see supply S and demand D, right? So the law of supply essentially says this right here. When the price of a good rises, right, the price is going up. You can see it over here on the Y axis. The quantity supplied of that good will also rise. Okay, and when the price of a good falls, the quantity of the good supplied will also fall. So it makes sense. You can see quantity over here on the x-axis, price on the y-axis, and it's going up and it's going down. Okay, guys, this is the law of demand. So it's a little bit different, but if you look at the graph here, you can see the purple line, right? It's going down. And essentially what the law of demand says is when the price of a good rises, the quantity demanded falls. Okay, so you can see the price is going up on the y-axis, the quantity is going over there at the x-axis, okay? And when the price falls, the demand rises, okay? So it's going back and forth and back and forth, whatever way you want to look at. Okay, I got a joke for ya. Let's see if you guys can get it. What did the pirate say when he turned 80? I matey! <laughs> okay, equilibrium. <laughs> How do demand and supply ever meet in a market system like what we have here in the United States without any restrictions such as taxes or other regulations? The price of a good will come to an equilibrium point where the two curves of the graph intersect. Okay, so you can see right here where the supply curve and the demand curve are intersecting. Equilibrium point E. All right, at this point, the quantity demanded and the quantity supplied are directly equal. 
Okay. So at this price, suppliers find it worthwhile to supply as many of whatever item they're making as consumers are willing to buy. Okay. There's another thing that we need to talk about, and we will discuss this all throughout the year, but it is a term called externalities. Okay. Unfortunately, markets composed of many buyers and sellers do not always take into account to account all of the cost of production and stuff like that. So usually when we're talking about externalities, we'll talk about negative externalities. Okay, so this is when a person or an entity like an organization bears no direct cost for any damage to natural resources. Okay, it could be damage from land degradation by organizations or, you know, a group of people or the government, something like that. So an example, if you guys are kind of confused, could be coal. Okay, when we go mine for coal to use to, to burn and generate electricity, we include the dollar cost of the coal. Okay, we include the cost to generate the electricity. We include the cost of paying the people that work at the coal plant to actually burn it and, you know, turn it into electricity. Okay, everything like that. But we don't include the cost of emitting sulfur dioxide, carbon dioxide, all sorts of other waste products and things like that. Those are negative externalities that even though they may be impacting something else, we're not paying money for. So another example you could use would be, there's a family that lives downwind of a coal plant, right? The coal plant is constantly burning coal, creating all these emissions. And the, this family downwind of the has some sort of lung cancer or something like that, but they have to go to the doctor and they have to have lots and lots of medical tests done, et cetera, et cetera. And that costs a lot of money for that family, right? So this would be a negative externality that the coal plant isn't taking into consideration, but somebody else is bearing the weight of that cost. Okay. So it's kind of a bad situation. But what happens to the supply and demand if we can take into account the cost of those externalities? So let's look at this graph right here really quick. Okay. So if we included all these negative externalities in the true cost, that's a term that we're going to use throughout the year, the cost for most items produced would be greater, right? It makes sense. If we included it, things would cost more money. Basically, the only way this can happen on this planet is if we have some sort of regulatory agency that imposes it and forces us to do it. Okay, so what you see in the graph here is just a shift. Okay, so you can see the supply has shifted upward. Instead of saying S, it's a dotted line and it says supply S1. All right, that means another thing has also switched. The equilibrium point that was right here has changed to be E1 and that's the new equilibrium point. Okay, so essentially this is just reflecting the true cost of the item and you guys can you know, read a little bit more in your textbook and stuff, but this is the gist of it that you need to know. There are two other terms that you guys need to know. All right. You probably learned all about this if you took like AP Human Geo or something like that, but there is a term called GDP, right? Gross domestic product. So we're going to talk about this a lot this year, especially when we talk about overpopulation and stuff like that. But we've typically used GDP in the past for countries as a measure of well-being. All right. But it's been criticized for lots of different reasons. And one of the main reasons is because when you measure the GDP, <laughs> when you measure the GDP of a country, you're not taking into account these negative externalities such as pollution and stuff like that. So even though the United States might have a strong GDP, we're not taking into account, um, you know, our environmental hidden costs and stuff like that. So what a whole bunch of people did was they came up with this term called the GPI, the Genuine Progress Indicator. All right. Basically, this is similar to a GDP, but it attempts to address this shortcoming by including all of these measures of, you know, personal consumption, income distribution, levels of higher education, da -da 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 -da, stuff like that. Okay. So it's trying to be more specific and it's trying to take into account these environmental costs. So what's happened is and you can look at the graph here, we've seen that if countries um, continue to measure their, you know, well-being by GDP, it looks as if over time the uh, per capita value in thousands of U.S. dollars is increasing. But if they look at it instead to measure the GPI and they're taking into account all of those negative externalities, it's actually leveling out right here. Okay, so think what you want about that. We'll talk about it more in class. Oh my gosh, this is so cute. Isn't this cute? I saw this on Instagram the other day, so I thought I'd show you it. 
Oh, look at him. He's so cute. His mom stole his pop tarts and then he was angry for his class pictures. Ha ha. Okay. Next thing. This is a really awesome practice, particularly for people in areas with high poverty. So people who don't have a lot of money, right? Where they get a very small loan. And with that loan, they, um, basically give back to the economy and they start to build on it. So it's not a model of charity, but it's more of a financial approach that allows, you know, this initial small sum of money to be reinvested many times over to the benefit of the local economies. Okay. So the recipients of a microloan are typically too poor to get one from an actual bank and stuff like that. But, uh, micro lending helps push sustainable development. So there's a really good documentary on Netflix. If you guys ever want to watch it and it's called living on $1 a day, um, where these guys, they're American, they go down to Guatemala, but they take out a micro loan and they try to live like the natives there. And it's not really about environmental science, but it kind of shows their experience with this, right? There's a whole bunch of good stuff in your book about this that you should check out. But the dude who originally came up with this concept was from Bangladesh and it's helped a lot of people there, but he ended up winning a Nobel peace prize. So that's pretty awesome. Okay. These are just two uh, graphics here that are describing two different types of economies. Okay. So the one on the top is a less sustainable economy. So it's showing we're putting in more energy, taking or using not so much from ecosystem services, a lot of resource extraction and therefore our output creates a lot of waste. This would be an economy like the United States of America. Okay. This is a more sustainable economy down here. So we're using less energy, utilizing more ecosystem services, not, uh, re or sorry, not extracting too many resources. And also we're trying to make an effort to put more, uh, I guess, put more waste back into the recycling stream. So our waste is less. All right. These are terms that we might talk about throughout the school year, but they're a thing called environmental worldviews. Okay. And we have basically three different types of worldviews. So first there's anthropocentric. It considers that human beings have intrinsic value and nature should provide for our needs. Okay. That's anthropocentric. Good grief. That's the anthropocentric worldview if I can ever say the word biocentric means it's life centered, right? Bio life centric centered. So this essentially just says that humans are one of many species on earth. We all have equal value. People who have a biocentric worldview consider that it's our obligation as human beings to protect other species. Um, some other people think that it's our obligation to protect every living creature. The difference with the ecocentric, which means earth centered, right? People who agree with this worldview demand that we consider nature free of any associations with our existence. Okay. So people insist that we have no right to interfere with nature and its diversity and stuff like that. So why do any of these matter? Right. That's probably what you're wondering right now. It actually plays a pretty big part in, you know, our countries or our nations as a whole. So if you live in a country that has more of an anthropocentric worldview, which would be something like where we live right now in the U.S., that means that our policies and our regulation are going to cater to that type of thing. So in the United States, our policies and regulations allow lots and lots of economic development, and we don't take as much concern for the effect that it will have on the natural environment. Meanwhile, a country that has more of an ecocentric overall worldview, you know, they're going to put more care into taking into account the environmental aspects when they're, you know, planning their policies and their regulations, stuff like that. So those might be some Northern European countries. Um, Costa Rica is a really well-known one in Central America that does a great job with environmental regulations and stuff like that. We'll talk more about that as the year goes on. So you do need to know the names of some world agencies. So let me explain this, right? You all know what the United Nations is, UN. So after World War II, that's when the UN was founded, right? It's basically an institution that's dedicated to promoting dialogue among countries with the goal of maintaining world peace, which is awesome, right? Since we created the UN back then, there have been lots of other international agencies created as well. So four of the important ones that you should be familiar with are the ones listed here. The United Nations Environment Program, the World Bank, the World Health Organization, which we talked about with uh, the cats of Borneo activity 
and the United Nations Development Program. There are also some in the United States that you should know. So let me just kind of explain how these came to be. In 1969, there was a really big oil spill that was off the coast of Santa Barbara, California. Maybe you guys have heard about it. And it wasn't the first that we had, but it lays. And once they tamed it a little bit, it still continued to leak throughout the year. But um, it got a lot of media attention, okay? After this happened, Earth Day started the next year in 1970, right? So this oil spill and the media attention involved in that was kind of the first big thing that really spurred the environmental movement. We've created these agencies in the United States. So one that you might be really familiar with is the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. We've got OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. And also we have the DOE, the Department of Energy. Okay. So you guys are really lucky because in the past years, there were like 50 different agencies, legislations and stuff like that you had to memorize. But this year, there's only like 10. So I'll make sure you have the list and we will be good to go. <laughs> So here's your riddle, today's riddle. I'll read it to you. I have cities, but no houses. I have mountains, but no trees. I have water, but no fish. What am I? Let's see if you can figure it out and I'll tell you the answer in class. I think that is it. And I just want to say, have a fantabulous day. I will see you guys in class when I see you. And smell you later. Bye.